everyone being present, this town meeting is called to order. Very quickly, before we rise for, for uh, invocation Pledge of Allegiance, uh, to being two days after Veterans Day, I'd like all the veterans to stand to be recognized. Thank you very much. Now, everyone, please rise for the invocation to be given by Mr. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Let us pray as we bless our work we are to start tonight. This past weekend, we celebrated those who protect us throughout the country. As this body has done just now, and in the past, we honor and thank all veterans who protect our liberties. We thank those who have served, those who are serving, and those who will serve in the future. We pray not only for their well-being, but for their families. We thank the families for the support of their loved ones. To those veterans who have been harmed, we pray for their healing. Our world may, not be, divi may, not, may be divided, and thus we may not live in a perfect world. But I remind all those here that as we will pledge allegiance to the American flag in a minute, that we should always remember those who stood and those who presently stand behind that flag. Recent events have been very distressing to many. Events in Las Vegas, Texas have shocked our world. To those family and friends of those who lost their loved ones and were injured in those uh, events, we send our prayers and well wishes. We especially wish those injured both physically and mentally during these distressing events to gain a speedy and full recovery. On to the work we are before us now. We once again pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the issues we are here to face during these sessions. We pray for tolerance and respect. We ask for this for those whose thoughts and opinions we disagree with and those who disagree with our own thoughts and opinions. We should strive to build bridges of understanding and not walls against it. We are here to determine what is best for the citizens of the Reading and those who are affected beyond our borders. We pray for a clear picture of the issues and that way we can apply the wisdom, the knowledge and understanding each of us has gained to the decisions we have made here. We should all be considered co-workers here. We should all ask ourselves, do I do the work that is needed here? Do I put in the effort? Do I listen to others? Do I learn? My friends, and I have, as I have in many years, the past few years, I remind us all that we all should consider ourselves friends here. There are naysayers to what we do here. There are those who try to divide us to their advantage. But every time we come to this hall, each of us and all of us collectively should set aside those naysayers and the distractions and should try to, try to do what is best and fair decisions that benefit all. We ask that we be lead to seek beyond our reach and that we be given the courage to stand before all to see the best paths to follow. Following up on our decisions, we should try to facilitate those decisions and avoid any further distractions that avert and divide us from those decisions. Then with perseverance, sacrifice, and with God's grace, there should be a positive result to our decisions. Praise the Lord, God bless America, amen. Now the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The town clerk has just informed me that we have a few new town meeting members just elected tonight. If you would remain standing to take the oath of office. All right, please repeat after me. I solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent on me as a town meeting member according to the best of my ability and understanding agreeable to the Constitution and laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and to the Charter and Bylaws of the Town of Reading so help me go. Welcome.
Now the town clerk. Point of order. You just uh, indicted as the new members just took an oath of office, upholding the constitution of the state. The constitution of, United, of Massachusetts does not require that they take an oath of office. Thank you. Town clerk will now read the warrant. To any and of the constables in town of Reading, greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby required to notify and warn the inhabitants of the town of Reading, qualified to vote in the local elections and town affairs, to meet at the Reading Memorial High School Performing Arts Center, 62 Oakland Road, in said Reading, on Monday, November 13, 2017, at 7.30 o'clock in the evening, at which time in place the following articles are to be acted upon and determined exclusively by town meeting members in accordance with the provisions of the Reading Home Rule Charter. Mr. Arena moves, we dispense with further reading. Is there, any, is there a second? Second, all those in favor? Those opposed? Motion carries. Now we get the return. By virtue of this warrant, I, Thomas H. Freeman, Jr., on October 26, 2017, notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Reading, qualified to vote on town affairs, to meet at the place and the time specified by posting attested copies of the town meeting warrant in the following public places within the town of Reading. Precinct 1, Warren Killam School. Precinct 2, Reading Police Station. Precinct 3, Reading Municipal Light. Precinct 4, Joshua Eaton School. Precinct 5, Reading Public Library. Precinct 6, Barrows School. Precinct 7, Birch Meadows School. Precinct 8, Wood End School and Town Hall. The date of posting being not less than 14 days prior to November 13, 2017, the set date of town meeting in this warrant. I also caused a posting of this warrant to be published on the town Reading website on October 26, 2017. Thank you. Uh, before we begin town meeting, uh, we have a few members who would like to rise for a point of personal privilege. We begin with Ms. Janice Jones. Hi, I'm Janice Jones, Precinct 5. Um, I asked to uh, speak to town meeting members tonight because I really would like to um, have the Reading residents hear what I have to say. Um, I lived in, I am an owner of the, um, a unit in the old Reading schoolhouse. And on June 1st, at one o'clock in the afternoon, Four units in that building um, went on fire and are completely destroyed and open to the sky right now. Um, no one is living in the building and um, there was smoke damage and water, a lot of water damage. Um, so I wanted to um, reach out and thank the Reading residents for their um, wonderful help, especially that day, um, the policemen, the firemen, uh, business, all the businesses in town were so helpful. Uh, the churches, um, they just jumped right in and were helping us. And because uh, we didn't get back in that, no one's back in that building. It's completely empty. It has been um, torn back to the studs. There's no walls, floors, furnished appliances. Um, it's completely empty except for the studs. But we are going to rebuild, um, and we have hired um, Silverman um, Trykowski Associates to be the contract, the um, architect, and the bids are out right now to um, hire contractors. That next week we will decide on a contractor to get that roof covered and windows in before winter starts, um, so that we can start working on the inside. So I just have to reach out to all the Reading business um, residents because they just have been so sympathetic and so caring and 
gave such financial support to all the body resident um, owners of that building. And we are forever grateful to them. Um, some of the um, associations in town and the um, citizens had, uh, had benefits to raise funds to um, be given out to the um, owners and the Reading Cooperative Bank handled all of that. Um, and then the gift cards. I'm telling you, it was just amazing how many people gave gift cards um, unanimously. We don't have any idea who the people are that donated so generously for food, for clothing, for toiletries, um, for whatever we needed. Um, so we thought this was a great way to reach them because they watch, they watch us in here. And um, we want them to know that we are forever grateful for their generosity, caring. Um, so I just, I, you know, one thing people want to know is how long is it going to be before we get back in there? It's going to be a long time. Um, just think about if you've ever had any construction done in your home. It never finishes on time. It's always slow. But we are determined. I'm one on the board, and we are determined that we are going to push these guys. We want to get back in that building. I am now living with my son, and uh, I'm very grateful for that, but it's it's not easy on any of us. <laughs> so I hope he's not listening because uh, I don't want him to think I'm not grateful because I am so grateful for anything, any help. I, I feel like the traveling gypsy, really. Um, so I, I hope that the Reading residents realize how um, grateful we are. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Next, person, a uh, note of personal privilege by Mr. Russell Graham. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I rise with your indulgence this evening to recognize two of our long-term town meeting members, who, as their lifestyle moves on, take a new direction and will soon be leaving the town of Red. They do so, I know, with very mixed emotions. Jack and Peg Russell are only slightly behind Bill Brown in years served as members of this body. Jack, since 1973, and paid since 1980. And their legacy of service to this community is truly remarkable. Peg is a member of the League of Women Voters, joined with that group in studying, probing, and changing the way town government conducted its business not always to the joy of the town fathers. And in that time, they were mostly fathers. The effect the League had on Reading was dramatic and still ongoing. Peg was one of the first, Jack on her side, to move or try to reform for Reading. Peg went on to serve on the school committee championing the value of education in concert with the needs of the community as a whole. She served, much to my delight, as a member of the Finance Committee during the turbulent introduction of Proposition 2 and a half and the result of the town's fiscal guidelines and difficulties associated with preparing the budget. She did so with prudence, wisdom, tact, and understanding. Recently, she served on the study committee addressing changes to the charter, and her course was always 
a steady contributor to the proceeds of this meeting. Jack is a member of the pre-charter elected Board of Public Works, and among other things, helped that body to recuperate from the sad history of the child incinerator. For those of you who know nothing about the incinerator, a quick word of advice. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> when the town decided to add two additional selectmen, Jack was first in line to step up to that challenge. And I can attest firsthand that his services to that board borders on the legend. He was involved in the invitation of the new charter the hiring and mentoring of a new town manager, and a whole new town organization. He moved on as a liaison to the Board of Selectmen for the moving of the Public Works facility to prepare what would become Walker's Brook Drive and the opening of the entire area to development. He was involved in the beginning of the sale of our landfill, which up to that point we always called the dump. He was heavily involved in the negotiations with TASC, keeping them in ready and creating a building and landscape to attract new businesses to ready and help with the challenges of finding new revenues. And in his spare time, he was a member of the bylaw committee for a number of years. Jack went on to serve on the downtown parking task force, a part of the recent renovations of our downtown area. Jack served on the newly formed Economic Development Committee. And again, I can attest first came to his contribution. When the ADC proposed and implemented the Reading Fall Town Fair, Jack volunteered, he did volunteer, <laughs> to be the director of logistics. It was no easy task, but as we now know, a fabulous success. The fact is that if you were to examine the good things that accomplished in the years they have served, you can see everywhere the direct imprint of what their children call this dynamic duel. But as important as all of these deeds have been of equal importance is the manner in which they did them. They conducted themselves always with grace, with courtesy, and with respect setting a hallmark for the conduct of town government to which all of us should aspire. And so, Mr. Moderator, I presume to speak for town meeting, and beyond that, the people of Reading in thanking you with immense gratitude for all they have done to bless this town, we and surely they so dearly love. We as a community, Thank you.
Ron was a beacon of hope, of justice, and good humor, and we'll miss him. Thank you, Ron. Okay, just a couple more pieces of business, then we'll get moving. A few years ago, we instituted a new practice. We no longer read motions as you all have printed copy. The only time it is read is if there is a change from what you have. The moderator instead declares the motion to have been made. Then we call on the main proponents to open discussion. Then we hear relevant reports, financial articles are reported by the Finance Committee, bylaws, changes by the Bylaw Committee, and so forth. Then we open debate to all members. Amendments, another change we made a few years ago. Once an amendment is proposed and seconded, we debate only the merits of the proposed amendment, not the main motion. When ready, we vote on the proposed amendment, then we return to debating on the main motion, either as it stood before the proposed amendment or as amended, depending on how the vote went. Uh, one other tradition we have is we try to get any instructional motions that are known, we like to let you know what they are at the beginning of the meeting, even though we don't get to them until the end. One is uh, to move the Board of Selectmen and instruct the town manager to place on the capital improvement plan the sum of $2,500,000 by debt or otherwise for the construction of the cemetery building in the fiscal year 2019. The other is a motion to instruct the bylaw committee with the Board of Selectmen um, where appropriate to remove all gendered language from the general bylaw and the charter. Those will come up later. And now we move to Article 1 reports. Mr. Lulasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator, uh, town meeting members. Uh, just a little over a year ago, uh, the prospect of commercial marijuana passing the state became a little clearer to us. Um, so we started to sort of lay some groundwork. And in fact, just about a year ago, it, it did pass. It did not pass in writing. It did pass in the Commonwealth. Um, I stood before this body um, last April and described some of the efforts as uh, belt suspenders and super glue that was necessary as town council, the selectmen, CPDC, and staff um, tried to uh, exert the will of the voters in a completely uncharted terrain. Um, we would ask advice from the attorney general and from the state in general, and they had no advice for us. They didn't know what the rules would be. So we did, uh, again, very careful work uh, to disallow commercial marijuana. Um, over that period of time and since, um, town meetings actions, the state has actually laid out a lot of ground rules. Our super glue is no longer necessary. So this, the, uh, our reps actually asked us, requested that we withdraw the uh, home rule petition, which after a brief discussion, certainly with town council and with the selectmen we agreed to do, I felt that certainly uh, you deserve to know that. I was also, I was interested that it could be just a vote of uh, either myself or the selectmen to withdraw a home rule petition. That's something I was not aware of. But again, our state reps and senator are very appreciative of that fact because the existing uh, request was at, at odds with some of the new state law and completely superfluous. Thank you. Next report. Do we have a 375th report, Mr. Rushworth? Yes. Okay, Mr. Rushworth. Town meeting, Phil Rushworth, Precinct 5, and a member of the Reading 375 Steering Committee. Uh, we are celebrating Reading's 375th anniversary in the spring of 2019, and we're looking for help on our subcommittees. Some of the things that the committee so far has done is um, we'll be having our first fundraiser on Friday, so those of you that are available, you can check out our website, uh, reading375.com. Tickets are still available for our trivia night. We need help with organizing the actual events for 2019. Some of the things that we're thinking of having, uh, an opening ceremonies, a historical movie, a porch fest, a downtown celebration, a grand ball, a lecture series, musical events, and a closing ceremony with fireworks. And of course, this is also in the planning phase, and if anyone has any ideas to, they'd like to help and, and add, we can change them and make them final. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, uh, in the back if you want to ask me for anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Monterey. Thank you. Next is the Municipal Light Department. Ms. O'Brien. <laughs> Good evening. I'm 
Colleen O'Brien, General Manager of Ready Light. Um, thanks. Uh, I wanted to um, call attention to some of my commissioners. Um, Chairman Phil Pacino, uh, I want to personally thank you for that invocation. As a daughter of a veteran and also as a mom of a veteran, your words were very thoughtful and well spoken. Thank you. And Tom O'Rourke, one of our Screen. commissioners, and our community um, relations manager, Joyce Mulvaney, is here for support. Thank you. Okay, what do we got? Is that beautiful? So first, I'm proud to announce that this is our fifth year for our Electronic Paperless Annual Report. Yay. So you can find it on our website. So we didn't kill any trees for that. And um, we'll continue on that uh, path. Um, just one announcement. We have a holiday light decorating contest that's coming up where you could submit photos of your homes uh, online. And then there'll be a customer vote based on the photographs. Uh, so that's something to look forward to. And also, anyone that's been struggling with our website in the spring, we should have something updated, so it'll be much user-friendly. So thank you for those announcements. Um, so along with our annual third grade art contest, this past year we held our first annual high school art contest. Fifteen students over this past summer took time out of their day to meet at the RMLD to learn about the value of conservation especially during peak demand times when electricity is at its highest and when most of the inefficient and environmental impacting <coughs> generators are called into action. So this year I would like to announce our first place winner with her uh, portrait entitled Electric Tree by Laura Buscemi from the North Reading High School. Second place from Reading Memorial High School is Megan Corum, which actually donned the back of our uh, Public Power Open House Week uh, t-shirts. It's beautiful. Good. Wait, couldn't wait to see it up on the big screen. Third place was Sophia Bonacorsi from Wilmington High School, showing how our customer service from the Reading Light. And then this is my one of my favorites. And I always add a little humor. Fourth place, Patrick Casella. Says, too high a cost for electricity. A little off the top, please. When he asked us to peak, what he would like. So those are great. Okay, so I'll leave that one up. <coughs> anyway, so I just have a short presentation, and then uh, we'll move on. So we are committed. We are committed to developing strategic visions within each of our divisions. Visions look beyond short-term plans and aim at predictive analysis to help navigate through areas of volatility projected for the future. Much, much change has and will continue to impact the electric industry. In talent management, succession, and the millennial generational transition, energy capacity and transmission marketing, prices of fluctuating renewable and sustainable, sustainable energy production, exponential technology development, and risk management being key. The RMLD is working to ensure that the short and long-term plans are strategically designed and continuously reviewed to meet the challenges of the present and future. We have successfully transitioned to a proactive cyclic maintenance scheduling, providing a solid basis to our planning efforts. To reiterate our objectives, a quality electric utility must have the ability to be proactive in all disciplines of planning, including system function and operation. It must in integrate its proactive measures to react efficiently by utilizing planned reaction procedures for unforeseen events such as weather and power market volatility. Working strategically ensures that the utility remains aligned with the path to success. Ensuring that there is a sufficient generation and transmitting facilities into and around this Boston FEMA zone area is an ongoing effort of the ISO New England grid operators. New England capacity deficiencies have resulted in recent cost escalations. The RMLD focuses on peak reduction remains a critical factor in offsetting these costs. A major RMLD accomplishment 
last year was the installation of a new 2.5 megawatt gas generator, which we located at substation three. Commissioned online this past summer, the new generator has been dispatched for operation during peak hours, saving costs. The RMLD also advanced its peak reduction efforts through public education. RMLD's Shred the Peak campaign was a main driver in this year's elementary school art contest, and as mentioned, at our high school art contest as well. The RMLD is pleased to have achieved 100% subscription to its first Solar Choice Community project at 326 Ballardville Street in Wilmington, which is now operational. This type of project allows the community to invest in the benefits of renewable energy. Generation such as community solar projects reduce RMLD's peak demand when located within its service territory and lessens the cost associated with these capacity requirements. The RMLD is currently, currently accepting enrollments for its second solar project at 40-50 Fordham Road in Wilmington, which is anticipated to be complete by the end of 2018 fiscal year. The RMLD continues to work in concert with our service towns and private commercial businesses to provide more opportunity for solar benefits to our customers within the parameters of proper physical electric system balancing and safety. The RMLD moves forward with a strong strategic vision, so join us while we work together to get more green, go more paperless, and be more efficient and shred more peaks. I just put together some of the highlights. Uh, this presentation, just to remind everyone, is for FY17. Uh, we just actually had our audit uh, meeting this past Thursday. So when you get a look at the copy of the audit online, uh, it still says draft, but there's been no changes, uh, and it all went through swimmingly. So it was a clean audit with no management letter. Uh, with, and we were told to have a strong position. So that was a great accomplishment. Uh, I already mentioned the 2.5 megawatt um, gas-powered distributed generator installed in the North Reading substation. The Solar Choice Community Program, 100% subscription, that's 500 customers uh, at the 326 Ballardville. That's a one megawatt solar uh, array. We are now accepting subscriptions for Project 2, which is 660 customers. As of right now, Joyce, we're about at half, correct? Or about half. So we need you guys to call at 40 to 50 Fordham Road in Wilmington, and that's a 1.67 megawatt array. Uh, every three years, we do a cost of service study to make sure that our rates are, are um, bringing back in our cost of production. So that cost of service study was done. Uh, the Shred the Peak Educational Campaign, the High School Student Contest, um, the updated efficiency programs and rebates includes now a new customer rebate portal, which means when you're trying to get your rebates for your appliances and all of the, the great things that we offer to help with the efficiency and conservation, when you go online, you can make out your applications right there and submit them right online. So that's, uh, that should help. Uh, and then the continued implementation of our organizational reliability study that I had mentioned the last year. Just to go over some of the efficiency and peak reduction measures, um, we, our entire rebate structure that we have for all of our rebates is based on how much money we save or how much we're anticipating to save in that peak time period. So when we're shaving the peak or we're shredding the peak, all of that money that's saved is what goes into our rebate structure. We have commercial energy incentive programs, lighting rebate programs, electrical vehicle charging station rebate program. We just actually got receiving a grant from that um, Volkswagen um, program. The RMLD held, held a lunch and learn for commercial industrial municipal customers participating in the peak reduction program and the appliance rebates for the residentials, residents, residential energy assessments as well. The RMLD has a residential online store offering 50% off of retail prices on an assortment of LED light bulbs and advanced power strips. So if you need holiday lights, best place to go. Shred the Peak educational campaign with community outreach. Um, state funding grants we're exploring for the 
uh, energy storage uh, batteries. So that's a new and upcoming technology that we're gonna be getting into and more continuing to encourage customers to go paperless. So if we do not have your email and you wanna give us your phone number, our new uh, outage management system, which we are hoping will go online uh, this next year in the spring, uh, we'd like to be able to text you outage updates. I know right now we're using Twitter, so make sure we have your latest email and, and any phone that you'd like to receive receive texts on those um, those critical information. I think I showed you this slide last year. It's just kind of an overview of our solar choice program, and since we do have our second project open, uh, this is kind of how the program works. Um, a lot of folks that are not able to install solar on top of their own homes are really excited about um, having a community opportunity. If you need any more information, you can uh, give Joyce a call, uh, or customer service, or uh, contact the Arnoldi. As far as economic development is concerned, over the last couple of years, uh, you know, rates have gone up a little bit. Our, our sales have flattened. Um, the area is is built up pretty much, as everyone can. You know, see for themselves. We have some some pockets of economic development that we that we're trying to target with working with each of the towns. Um, there is a section in Wilmington where they've built Target that we're still focusing on, and uh, we're going to be building a new substation there to bring more capacity into that area. But when different companies come in, these are some of the uh, discussions that we had. We we had met with Osram Sylvania, which is now in Wilmington, which is one of their flagship um, customers. And these are some of the things that we say about the RMLD. We're locally owned and operated. We're, our reliability exceeds region, regional and national averages. Our response time is excellent. Our customer service programs are excellent. Our rates are competitive. The efficiency, incentive, and rebate programs are excellent. We are enhancing our communication on a continuous uh, basis and we are green and renewable to meet our objectives. I had mentioned last year about our proactive maintenance programs. We are 100% um, have implemented all 10 of these maintenance programs. You might have seen you know, more heavier uh, tree trimming programs to cut them back from the lines. We've seen a reduction in the outages caused by trees, animals with animal guards. We are. Um, inspecting poles, we're inspecting transformers, and we're getting everything right back to where it needs to go so that we can meet the challenges of the future. Um, but all of the maintenance programs are up and running. The LED streetlight program, uh, we are 78% complete. We had received a grant for that, and the grant was split 50-50. 50% -50. Um, went towards municipal lighting, uh, for all four towns, and the other 50%, this was up 250,000, uh, went to just in general LED upgrades, which went to commercial and other rebates of uh, commercial, residential, and industrial customers that apply. So right now for uh, FY17, we have 2,257 done for next year, 854 left, and then we will be 100% complete. And I will tell you, everyone seems to be 100% happy because I have not gotten any complaints other than compliments. So I'm hoping everyone is happy with the lighting. Uh, I think it serves well for um, visibility. And if you have any issues, please give me a call, but it seems to be a successful program and certainly paying back the community some of the money for, um, for switching to LEDs and we appreciate that. This just demonstrates uh, the estimated savings for the town of Reading was $54,000 and that was broken up into, um, into the three year uh, program. You should get a credit this week. And then everybody else's favorite is the double poles. Uh, this is a snapshot of double poles because this is an engine's report. That means that when a double pole goes in, depending on who is the custodial area, whether it's Verizon or RMLD, uh, the pole goes in and then each of the utilities has to come and transfer. So Comcast comes and transfers their wires. Uh, 
whether you have fiber, fire department, the light department, uh, and telephone. And so it goes ball and court, and then the pole comes out. So these numbers are a snapshot in time because it's constantly moving, and what I mean by that is we may take out 10 one week, but then we might put in 12 because we're putting a whole new circuit and we're upgrading a circuit. So just so everybody kind of understands that. Um, so the last person on pulls the pole butt, which is why it says pull pole, and everything else is a transfer. So this is ongoing, we update this daily. Uh, if you happen to have one in front of your house that has been there for you think is longer than it should be, please call the office and we'll see where it is on the list. Um, we, we should be getting to the point where there shouldn't be the, something that had been sitting there for years and years and years. So please call and we'll make sure that we get that taken care of. Um, and again, the, the town of Reading is split between Verizon and um, the RMLD. So uh, like Linfield is all Verizon, uh, North Reading is, is all RMLD, and um, Wilmington is all Verizon, meaning the custodial. And so we will work, if, it's, um, if it's a Verizon set in Reading, we'll make sure we do with, with diligence get, get it out of there if it's been there for a while. This is our strategic vision, just uh, highlights securing the land for the new substation five in Wilmington. We've been working on that. Uh, implementing the new power supply risk mitigation. We're trying to, because of the volatility, we're trying to capture more opportunity to lock in pricing. Uh, educating our customers on electrical vehicles and the availability of RMLD rebates for electrical vehicle charging stations. That small little parking lot in front of the RMLD will be reconfigured and we'll be having our first two, um, two plug vehicle charges there probably next spring. So we can look forward to that and hopefully placed around the town as, um, you know, as, as we find that they're, they're you know, needed. Um, expanding community outreach and school programs. Uh, we'd like to do, we do a lot with the schools. We'd like to do more. Um, we're completing the strategic visions for each of the divisions. Uh, we want to keep going with um, being efficient, pay, go paperless and get greener. We're continuing our talent management and succession planning to make sure that we have well-trained and employees that have the skill sets that are that can take care of an electric company. It's, it's dangerous work and we just want to make sure that our workers are safe and that our public is safe and that your lights are on. And then economic development opportunities that I had mentioned. And in closing, I just want to remind you to shred the peak. This is just a copy of the, the last three um, uh, annual report covers that have all been done in-house um, yeah. by students, free artwork. So uh, it's just one of the ways that we try to reduce the cost. Um, and we can do it with, with artwork that's just so much appreciated by the kids. I, I just Sorry, no. love this. I just love these pictures. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. Don't we have them hung in the uh, in the lobby if anybody's interested in seeing them up close. But I think we'll probably take a few of them and frame them. They're really worth really worth seeing. <coughs> that was just good. It's good that kids see that. That's how they see us. It's really nice. And this is just great humor. I love it. Thank you. Have a good holiday. <laughs>
market average, which as everybody knows who gets Social Security, can <laughs> fluctuate quite wildly, and in some years is next to nothing. So uh, Phil and I try to scare up the uh, CAB, that's the uh, Citizens Advisory Board, that's representatives from each of the four towns in the RMLD service area that advise the RMLD Board on matters pertaining to budget and other things. Uh, the CAB, I think in 98, was it, uh, Phil formed the committee to actually look into? 94, okay. Uh, the committee to look into stabilizing the uh, payments to Reading. Strangely enough, that committee never met. Uh, and we were able finally to get the CAB together in October. Uh, two members of the CAB, Phil and uh, uh, Mr. Stempek, John Stempek from the RMLD board, myself as the representative from Reading. Uh, we began discussions, exchanged ideas. Uh, those ideas were taken back to the CAB and the RMLD board, and we're expecting to meet again in November to keep this ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you. School Department update. Mr. Robinson? Oh, it's Weber. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, town meeting members, school staff, community members, and my fellow elected and appointed representatives. It's with great pleasure and pride that on behalf of the school committee, I have the opportunity to stand before you this evening to introduce our superintendent of schools, Dr. John Doherty. I have no doubt that Dr. Doherty's report on the state of the Reading Public Schools will be well received and will reflect positively on the district's collective work and collaboration in seeing that the vision is being fulfilled to the best extent possible in these challenging financial times. Reading's financial situation is no mystery to this body. Last year, the school committee, together with town meeting, made very difficult budget decisions, taking votes that were the best of the worst and implementing significant cuts in programs and staff. It is appropriate this evening to call upon a paragraph from our FY18 school committee budget, budget message. Every avenue has been explored by both the school and municipal side of our government, and the result is that there's only one solution for a town like Reading. We cannot develop our way out of this problem. We cannot raise fees to a level that would fix our structural deficit. The fact is we need to pass a Proposition 2 and have override to support our town and schools. If we want to continue to offer the level of education the students of Reading have historically benefited from, failure to pass an override means that our school system will continue to decline in the quantity and quality of our educational offerings. The pressures and the demands of providing excellence in education at 21st century standards for each and every learner, each and every learner, every one of the 4,200 learners in this district, cannot be achieved at our current funding levels. Dr. Darty will present three examples of our success and our progress. I urge you to actively listen as you hear the positive impacts our leadership, teachers, staff, and coaches are making with our students. I also ask that you listen for the challenges that now burden every success. You will hear the statement, we have been methodically and strategically with available resources improving special education in our district. The key phrase in that sentence is with available resources. Our rate of improvement and the height of our success is limited by our funding. As we move into the FY19 budget process, your participation and engagement is essential. Our budget process is transparent, open, and rigorous with your voice as an essential element in working through this challenge. We need our community to participate, our parents, the broader community, our students, our teachers who live here in Reading, all need to participate in this process. And it's going to be um, quite rigorous. There's going to be a lot of meetings and opportunities for people to be part of the process. The Reading Public Schools began a journey in 2003, from good to great to excellent. 
Under Dr. Doherty's leadership, Reading has continued to provide a great education to our students in spite of the financial pressures. Our journey is in jeopardy of now moving from great to only good enough. We must make a course correction. As a community, we will need to decide the value we place on Reading's public education. Will we be satisfied with outcomes and paths for our students that are just good enough? Or will we envision and expect outcomes of excellence with our students prepared in both breadth and depth for the most challenging future path that they can aspire to? Mr. Moderator, it is with great respect, admiration, and appreciation for his service that I introduce Dr. John Doherty, Superintendent of Schools, to deliver the State of the School Address. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, request an additional 15 minutes. Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, board of selectmen, finance committee members, school committee, fellow town leaders, and department heads, school building principals, district administrators, members of the school community, and invited guests. It is my great privilege tonight to represent the hundreds of dedicated educators of the Reading Public Schools and to deliver to you the annual State of the Schools Address. Without a doubt, the issue that every one of our educators would probably want to communicate to you tonight is that we are in a time of tremendous change in education. In this, the 21st century, change has been swift in so many different areas of life. With technology advances, social media, changing industries, and so much more, we all realize, of course, that the future our kids are preparing for is in many ways very different from when we were their age. To use a football analogy, over the last several years alone, the goalposts have been moved on us several times. Just in the past five years, there have been three new sets of state frameworks in science, mathematics, and literacy. And we've had three different state assessments, a more rigorous SAT and AP exam at the high school level, the increased role that technology plays in education, and an increased and understandable emphasis on the overall health and well-being of our students, especially given the opioid and substance addiction epidemic facing our society. While all of these changes are definitely in the best interest of our students, there is no question that they have put stress and strain on our administrative team and on our staff. As a district that is comparatively very lean in administrative leadership, one without curriculum directors or coordinators, Major changes are more challenging to navigate than for many other districts. In addition, all of this is happening during a time in Reading of tighter and tighter budgets, where each year the level service budget is being reduced from the previous year. On behalf of all of our teachers and administrators, I say this only because I think it's important to recognize the challenges our staff has collectively been facing and to express extreme gratitude for their ongoing efforts. Retired journalist and famous broadcaster Tom Brokaw is quoted as saying, there is a place in America to take a stand, and it is public education. Public education, after all, is the engine that moves us as a society toward a common destiny. It is in public education that the American dream begins to take shape. I know it is with this type of passion that the teachers of Reading have been setting new goals for our district and have been working tirelessly to align to the more rigorous standards from the Department of Education. There are areas that our staff has identified as requiring significant improvement, and we are certainly facing both fiscal and organizational challenges. In spite of these challenges, however, our staff has also been making some significant progress in revitalizing our district, and I know they are grateful for your continued support toward those efforts. 
Through this journey over the last few years, I have certainly learned a great deal as well. Some of it the hard way, but as educators, we are also great learners. As our students know, mistakes, adversity, challenges can make us stronger and better as long as we learn from the experiences. And our administrators, teachers, and staff are now profoundly moving this district in a direction that the entire community can and should be proud of, and one that will greatly benefit our children, who are the future of this community. To that end this evening, I want to give you three quick examples of where we are making significant progress in our school district, and how the educators of this community are making sure that the Reading Public Schools is poised for the future. First and foremost is our school's efforts in community building, which quite simply is creating the foundation for everything else we do. The 21st century may have brought us all tremendous change, but the foundational values of our community have remained unchanged, and in fact are actually being strengthened all during a time when our society seems to need it most. It is truly inspirational to see our educators and students demonstrate such team building, and the entire community can be very proud of the leadership role our schools are playing and are modeling for our children. For instance, at a time when communities all over the country are seeing an uptick in hate crimes or in hate-related graffiti, the staff and students of Reading have responded strongly and proactively by bringing people together, forming new partnerships, and strengthening our community values of respect and acceptance for all. Our plan focuses on response, communication, teamwork, and, and education. We are especially proud of the strong collaboration between the Reading Public Schools and the Reading Police Department. This relationship, which is not the norm in other communities, has only grown stronger and is built on communication, trust, and a sense of purpose to keep our students and staff safe. We've been very fortunate in this community to have strong leadership with Chief Sagala, his predecessor, Chief Cormier, and exceptional school resource officers who understand their role in a school setting. In addition, we have developed a strong relationship with the Anti-Defamation League, who is providing our teachers and administrators with ongoing support and training. They have been providing student training at our two middle schools and our high school for our World of Difference clubs. These clubs will lead the student response in creating a culture that promotes respect and embraces diversity. Last year, the student club here at the high school created a Reading Memorial High School Human Rights Resolution, which was embraced by both staff and students. Along the same lines, we have formed community partnerships with Reading Embraces Diversity, the Reading Clergy Association, and the Human Relations Advisory Committee, who are using their roles to involve our community and help educate them that this is a community problem which requires a community solution. To that end, in late June, Deputy Police Chief Clark and I met with over 40 members of the Jewish community to listen to their concerns and to better understand from them what these incidents symbolized. The conversation we had that evening was impactful and really resonated with me on the role our schools can play in our community. In short, through these challenges, we are bringing people together to forge new bonds and to model the values we hold dear for all our children. All of our schools have responded also with assemblies, activities, and curriculum that focus on the core values of respect for each other, including, for instance, the new Facing History in Ourselves program at the middle schools, which is designed to foster empathy and reflection, improve student academic performance, and helps build safe and inclusive schools for all students. This now leads to our second example, which is the district's commitment to closing the achievement gap among students and providing better supports, especially to our high needs population. Last year, our entire team of principals and administrators collectively determined that this must be an explicit goal to our district improvement plan and that our efforts over the next several years must be unwavering. In essence, in spite of the inherent challenges we are currently facing, our schools have a renewed commitment in providing an excellent education to all students, including and especially for our students with disabilities. And our staff are now taking bold steps in that direction. Three years ago, through the visionary and proactive leadership of Director of Student Services, Carolyn Wilson, we had Walker Associates do a thorough review of all of our special education programs and services. 
Through the recommendations of that report, we have been methodically and strategically, with available resources, improving special education in our district. In the last couple of years, our special education staff have been working hard to develop a consistency of common practices from school to school and from level to level. Our teachers and administrators have been engaged in a significant amount of training in specialized reading. And both special education and general education have been collaborating together to provide important professional development for staff. All of this has led not only to a more effective identification of students eligible for special education and appropriate services, but also to a more comprehensive understanding of effective instructional practices and to the identification of areas in which we needed to take steps to improve. Although we recently came to resolution with the Office of Civil Rights regarding issues from the 2014 and 2015 school years, staff members felt their efforts were validated as many of the issues had already been proactively addressed prior to receiving the notice from OCR. I believe it is a good indicator that we have staff who are striving to address issues and view complaints as feedback, as an opportunity to better serve all kids. It is a credit to our staff, and I can't thank them enough for that attitude as they are truly being excellent role models for our children. We have also recently begun taking initial steps for doing a complete review of our language-based special education program and specialized reading services and developing an action plan focused on improving that program and services for students with dyslexia and other language-based disabilities. Having strong in-district special education not only benefits our students as they are given the opportunity to be educated with their peers in the Reading Public Schools, but also it is a more cost-effective way to educate those students, which allows us to invest more of our educational funding to the general classroom. Over the last couple of years to support this work, and also part of the general and special education collaboration, we have also made tremendous progress in our implementation of a multi-tiered system of support for students. And Rennie is now seen as a leader in this area throughout the New England region. All schools now have building leadership teams in place to monitor and review student progress. And blocks of time, called intervention blocks, have now been established during the school day to provide better support and targeted assistance to all students who may need it. I know that staff will still be making improvements as we move forward and learn from these experiences, but the foundation has now been firmly built for future gains. These types of tiered supports, given in a timely manner, can help all students reach new levels of success. My final example this evening focuses simply on the quality of our staff and the work that they have been doing currently in teaching and learning. First, our community can be very proud of the strength of the team we have been assembling across all levels. Our expectations are high, and the new members of our team are making tremendous contributions. In fact, they are being specifically hired for their strengths that will complement and further the objectives we have set. Lisa Marie Ippolito, the new principal of the Josh Wheaton Elementary School and newest member to our administrative team, is a great example. She comes to Reading with a very strong knowledge base in literacy, mathematics, special education, and data analysis. In her leadership style, strong interpersonal skills, and knowledge of curriculum and instruction has been an excellent match for the Josh Wheaton Elementary School community. My goal is always to have had the highest expectations for myself, our educators, and our students. And I am proud to say that the staff of the Reading Public Schools is made up of some of the most dedicated and talented educators in the country, who are doing tremendous work to better prepare our children for their future. We have been focusing our district improvement plan for the last two years on updating, aligning, and improving our teaching and learning in our classrooms. Our schools are collaborating now and building upon each other's strengths in new ways, both as administrators and teachers. We have created new opportunities for teachers to work together at each grade level or content area, and we are building new capacities among all of our staff to analyze our students' behavioral and achievement data so that we can identify trends and direct interventions effectively. 
As an example, our outstanding data coach, Courtney Fogarty, explained to the school committee at a recent meeting how staff are now engaging in the process of collaborative inquiry. And I have received feedback from both principals and teachers about how transformative this coaching has been and how they believe their students will benefit from this engaging work. When a staff member takes time to call or email the superintendent or assistant superintendent to commend such steps and to express their gratitude for the work, for the support this work is yielding, we know that our kids will benefit and that we are headed in the right direction. These changes positively impact all students. And if you have a child or grandchild in our school district, you may have also noticed that we've been implementing new curriculum materials over the last few years to support our staff and to align with recent changes in science, mathematics, and literacy. In addition to our strong emphasis on literacy in the elementary grades, through your town meeting support, we've been able to begin implementation of new science curriculum resources in grades K through 12 that will provide us the tools to more effectively teach to the new science and engineering standards that were recently approved by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. These new standards focus more on problem solving, application, and the use of critical thinking skills. All skills that are necessary for our students to be prepared for college and career. Last year we began introducing new curriculum materials and technology in grades three through six. This year we are fully implementing new science curriculum and technology in grades seven through nine. And it is our goal in year three to complete implementation in grades K to two and 10 through 12. To better align to the state's revised standards, staff have also been establishing new K through eight curriculum documents in both literacy and mathematics. They've been engaging in professional development to support the necessary instructional shifts and are streamlining and revising report card standards to focus even more sharply on the expectations outlined in the state framework and assessed by the state's new next generation MCATs, which was just piloted this last year. Our effort and collaboration is focused firmly on the core issues and evidence of student learning. Student outcomes are being more clearly defined and student progress is being monitored more effectively. By building new structures and capacities of systemic support, all staff share in the accountability for student learning and they work together to achieve results. While we are still not satisfied and have a way to go, our educators are amazing. And I know it is their hope that the community continues to support them in this important work. Our teachers are making an impact each and every day for our students through their hard work, dedication, and their willingness to try out new ideas. Making mistakes, learning from those mistakes, and become even better educators as a result. And I am so proud of the fact that these educators have chosen the Reading Public Schools. And we are all so fortunate that they have chosen to make a difference in the lives of our children. To close tonight, as I do each year, I would like to take a moment to recognize a couple of these students. As for results of the work our educators are doing each and every day, there are no better examples than the two Reading Memorial High School seniors who are the recipients of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award for Academic and Community Excellence. It is always difficult to select only two students, given how many deserving candidates we have here at Reading Memorial High School. Both students being recognized this evening have demonstrated strong academic skills. They participate in extracurricular and community service activities and are currently in the top 5% of their graduating class. In addition, I've had the opportunity to meet with both students and their great kids. It is with honor and pride that I present this award to our first recipient, who is a student at the Joshua Eaton Elementary School and Parker Middle School and is a member of the Model United Nations Club. She volunteers at the Reading Public Library, where she serves as a net guide and helps senior citizens use the library technology. A member of the Reading Memorial High School Symphonic Band, this student has excelled in rigorous classes, including AP BC Calculus, Physics, AP Biology, AP French, AP Literature. In addition, this student is in the Wind Ensemble at the New England Conservatory of Music. This recipient envisions a career in biochemistry 
and is applied to Northeastern, UMass Amherst, Brown, Harvard, Tufts, Boston College, and Amherst College. She dreams about a career where she can have an impact on the lives of others. When asked which teachers had the greatest impact on her educational journey, she said Reading Memorial High School English teacher Andrea Mooney and Reading Memorial High School chemistry teacher Frank Bona. It is with great pleasure tonight that I recognize Erin Kwan. Erin, please come down to receive the 2017 <laughs> who is currently taking several high-level courses, including AP BC Calculus, AP Statistics, AP Physics, AP French, Philosophy of Literature, and Principles of Engineering. He is very involved in community service activities, teaching swimming to students at the YMCA who have developmental disabilities, and mentoring students in computer coding at Reading Public Library. Next year, he plans on majoring in computer science and is applying to MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Harvard, Northeastern, UMass Amherst, and RPI. The teacher who has had a significant impact on this student's journey is chemistry teacher Frank Bono, who turned a difficult class with a dense amount of information into a class he could freely enjoy. It is with great honor to introduce to you Matthias Kuhl. Matthias, please come down and accept the Massachusetts <laughs> Strong foundation 
for the future of this great community. Thank you. Mr. Arena moves that we lay the substance of Article 1 on the table. Is there a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Uh, Mr. Berman moves that we place the substance of Article 2 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Business under Article 3, Mr. Lowash. Three items are simply a swap. 
facilities was able to complete a project in the west side fire station for sixteen thousand dollars less than was appropriated and would like to request to move that to uh, the cemetery garage and the dpw garage for some improved windows and doors there is a couple things i do want to just call to your attention in fy19 again with a lot of details to follow in the budget process this winter <clears throat> There's a specific line, 200,000 for DPW school site improvements, Joshua Eaton. There are two schools called out by facilities and public works working together with the schools for some specific safety improvements. Generally speaking, this would be parking lot uh, and sidewalk and potentially fence improvements. Joshua Eaton is the first school uh, on that list. There's something new that again, through the budget process, you'll see that I am proposing water, sewer, storm water, and the general fund will each contribute $100,000 in the first budget year, if you will, to study our infrastructure ass assessments downtown. We have quite a lot of construction activity going on downtown. Some of it's still in the planning stage. It will take another two to three years. The time is now to study, to make sure we have the infrastructure underground to accommodate this rather than find out later. And also, uh, the general fund share would probably go towards things like parking and streetscapes. Uh, for town meeting members um, that go back several years, there was a downtown too, once proposed by my, my predecessor. This would be a small version of that, I, I suspect. Um, another couple of items just to point out, DPW parking lot improvement program, that's not the DPW yard, that's just any parking lot that's municipally owned could be improved. Likewise, DPW fence replacement program is any municipal fence uh, across town that can be improved. There are no changes suggested in any of the enterprise funds for the current year, and I won't go into much detail um, on the ones for next year, but happy to answer any questions. Income report, Ms. Perry. And the Financial Committee reconvened this evening and voted 7002 to approve Article 3 as amended. Mr. Mon? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. I'm sorry, Bob, what was the price for the wood end skylights? 480,000. 480,000. Mm -hmm. And can you remind us what the threshold is when we start to involve our new building committee? Um, we've asked the building committee, the chair is sitting over there um, at various times. And I, I guess I'll, I'll kind of describe their uh, number as Depending on the exact work, they may or may not get involved at their discretion. The number is about a million and a half. Um, that doesn't mean they won't get involved in smaller projects, but it doesn't necessarily mean they'll get involved in larger ones if it's not construction. Um, I don't remember, Greg, whether this was run past you. Um, I know similar items have been. But this, you know, relative to the benchmark of a million and a half, is certainly a small number. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Uh, <clears throat> Stelps. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Linda Phillips, Precinct 7. Um, on the um, second column, uh, for fiscal year 19, there's 575000 for the high, high efficiency boiler for our 11, 12 year old high school. Could you tell me why we need to replace the boiler that, isn't, that hasn't been fully utilized? Um, Joe, is that an old boiler? Yeah, I don't think that was replaced by the renovation. Much Can we use the microphone? Thank you. The boiler we're replacing 
was original to the building when the building was renovated. It was not pulled out and replaced as part of the renovation in 2004. And it was an old steam boiler converted to hydronic. So it, um, and it was not part of a water treatment program. So the boiler is not in that good shape. So we're targeting for replacement. Uh, yeah, we, we voted for a $53 million school that cost $59 million with a $6 million legal litigation settlement. And now we have to pay for a boiler because we were told we were going to get a new boiler with a new high school. Um, also, there's a question about town meeting appropriated $5 million for energy efficient program when we had a former assistant superintendent of finance. Um, that program was supposed to replace boilers, drafty windows and doors and things like that. Um, what have happened to that program and did the work under that $5 million cover charge for dealing with high, to get high efficiency um, equipment in our district and keep it on a renewable basis? We never saw anything that came from that $5 million. Is there a list somewhere of what we got for the $5 million? As part of the performance contracting initiative, we did uh, take part in replacing some of the large pieces of equipment in town, like the chiller at Town Hall, West Side Fire Station boilers, um, and a number of unit ventilators and air equipment at Killam and Birch Meadow. The boiler at the high school was not part of that program. Uh, the, it's a different pay, it's a longer payback, and we chose things that had a quicker payback on them. And those items I just mentioned, we did under performance contract. Okay, because there's windows and doors and all kinds of stuff here. We windows and doors, the windows and doors typically have like a, <coughs> it's a much longer payback on windows and doors. It's not something that usually is done in performance contract. I mean, do we know if they were replaced under that five mil? mil what did we get for the five million dollars that we're still doling out money? Mr. Valencia. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, are you busy December 12th, 13th, 19th, and 20th? Am I busy? Come to the Selectman's budget meeting. I will be there. I don't remember which one he's up for, but that's one of the things we really do owe an answer to the community, um, a thorough answer as to what did you invest and what did you get. I can tell you operationally it saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a good story. I look forward to hearing it. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moira, Bill Brown, Precinct 8, a member of the Cemetery Board of Trustees. When I originally saw the $8,000 for windows and doors, I said, what a waste of money. Uh, but I went and talked to the foreman uh, the other day, and he'd like to be able to get the trucks out of the building. Apparently, the, if my memory serves me right, the last addition went out of that building in 1962, which is 55 years ago, almost as long as I've been in town meeting. Further discussion? Yes, in the back. Bob Lynch, Precinct 6. Um, I saw a mention of $2.5 million for a cemetery building. Uh, how's that play into the idea of moving the DPW garage down to Camp Curtis? Mr. Walashen. Um, I don't want to steal all the thunder from an instructional motion, but I, I will say in the last year this, this body was requested to reduce the funding of the Permanent Building Committee for that purpose and agreed. Um, I was finally able to make public the idea of a shared facility in Wakefield, which we're working very hard towards at the meeting on Wednesday. I don't know if it will happen, but I certainly have no interest myself, or I, sh I should think the building committee also agreed last Monday in building a cemetery garage if we can put it at this shared site. So that would be the first choice if that fails in the cemetery garage could be quite appropriate. One, is, one has been, I guess the preliminary work of design has been done, not the design of the building, but the site uh, selection. But what you got feeling of it coming to fruition? Um, I don't think it'll be with, with me still living. <laughs> um, the library project was torture. This one's going to be just as hard. Um, 
I think it will happen, and I think it will happen in the next five years. I think it's going to be exceptionally difficult. We need to have dedicated staff for things like this that we have a hard time dedicating. Um, the Camp Curtis folks have been exceptionally welcoming. Wakefield is absolutely all in. Uh, we've had meetings at Beacon Hill a couple times with legislators. There was actually tremendous excitement because no one has done this in the whole country. Having said all that, it's a lot of work. And we'll do our best, so I'm optimistic, but I certainly can't promise. I think this body in a year will have a much better idea. Has there been any other talk about combining departments, local towns? We've regionalized different positions, but to combine a whole department is quite a chore. And, and just to be clear, to share a facility with Wakefield uh, DPW is not combining departments. Um, that would be another discussion for another day. But we will share equipment. We may share things like equipment maintenance. We may have a second shift of mechanics, for instance. But to actually integrate the department and make it fully combined is an exceptionally difficult thing with two communities and, and two sets of goals. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Good evening, Leah Barton, Precinct 8. How was the estimate for the, uh, the wooden skylight repairs derived? It seems like an awful lot of money. <laughs> Just a little uh, Joe, Joe Huggins can answer that one also. Mr. Huggins? Could you repeat that again? Yes. How was the estimate for the wood end skylight repairs derived? Um, on a routine roof inspection of the wood end, um, we were up there about a year ago, and we noticed that there was cracking of the polycarbonate skylights going on at the ridges, and there was some condensation developing in between the two layers. It was at that point that we had an architectural firm come out and a structural engineer to look at the skylights, and we were given some advice that we should replace them sooner than later to avoid any interior roof leaks to the building and to keep snow, a snow load off of them. So we've been shoveling them off for the last, last, last year now, keeping the snow clear again. The architectural firm has developed a cost estimate to replace the skylights with a system that is modular. Um, we're not sure if it's going to be um, a plexiglass or, a, or, a, or a, a glass skylight, but it will be modular and it will have replaceable panels. The system that's up there right now does not work well with a timber frame building, which the Wood End School is, so the new system will be fully serviceable and it's a structural component of that building also. And the standard warranty for skylights is 15 years or so? 15 to 20, you can buy a longer warranty period if you choose to. And we just didn't have that for the existing skylights. Yeah, they, they, they found that the VISTA system is very common in New England, but they found that it's just, it's very, it's affected by UV rays and also the fact that that building does move quite a bit because it's a timber frame. And that does cause the flex and the cracking that's going on. Okay. So it's out of abundance of caution that we're doing it also. Thank you. Further discussion? Hi, Mary Ann Downing, Heather Drive. Um, I might have missed when you talked about the DPW improvements. This is the FY19 for 200K DPW school site improvements for Joshua Eaton. What was that again for? I, don't, I just, it's was it security or what was that? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, it's not security in the sense that there's a separate security study, no. But it is to improve safety around the building. Uh, it will be parking lot, sidewalk improvements. Um, I don't know if there's, there's a fence along uh, one part. I don't know if that will be included. Um, but DPW primarily has gone around with Joe to all the schools and uh, cited, as I recall, two of them that really need more urgent repair than others. Yeah, because they just, with all of the water main stuff, they just redid the sidewalks along Oak yeah, Street. Yeah, that was Oak Street. Street. Yes. This is on the property itself. Okay. and. I have another question, um, just quickly related to the school Wi-Fi, because I wasn't at the meeting to ask this question, but I'm a little confused about how Windows 10 doesn't make the Wi-Fi um, hotspots work, because I thought it's more related to the network cards and the computers. Um, 
Is it just it made it slow, or did it really just not work at all? I, I don't. And you're asking me? <laughs> uh, maybe John. Can yeah, I I should have come to the meeting, John, to ask you. Sorry, I just was I was a little confused why Windows 10 doesn't work with the hospital. Unfortunately, I know way too much about this now. Okay. Um, so the old wireless access points, which we have throughout all of our buildings, they're called Xeris. They're not the industry standard anymore, and they're outdated, and we've had them for over 10 years in our, in our buildings. They do not connect well with Windows 10 machines. So we have intermittent wireless activity with the Windows 10 machines, and we've, we've had that since September. So the, the Windows so 7 machines and lower have been working fine, um, but we're, now we're doing a lot of replacing of, of technology and it's Windows 10 because you can't buy a computer now without Windows 10. Um, so a lot of our computers right now cannot connect to, to the internet wirelessly. Yeah, I just didn't know we had Wi-Fi hotspot. I thought our Wi-Fi hotspots were kind of new. I didn't know we had Wi-Fi hotspots. You see that access point right over there that looks like a little blue flying saucer? That's the new access point. That's what it looks like. Okay. Thanks. Further discussion? Yes. He's been there. He's covered Angela Ben to Precinct 5. Um, on page 4, there's a reduction in the, um, the Reading High School Turf 1 and the Reading High School Stadium Turf, and it says moved out to fiscal year 21 is 1 million and moved out to fiscal year 21 is 1.75 million. But in the blue sheet on page 5, it has one artificial turf at 1.75 and one at 2.25. Are those the same turfs and what is the discrepancy? It's a good question. Um, the blue pages are correct. I might have uh, incorrectly transcribed a number um, on the white one. Let me just take a quick look. Yeah, the, the turf one I, I know is a is a million and three quarters uh, to replace, uh, plus the track, which is potentially another million, and turf two needs a little more extensive work, two point two five million. So those are the numbers that are correct. Is turf two the stadium yes. turf? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so turf two is the stadium turf, and that says. I'm sorry, turf one is the stadium. Turf two is behind deep, uh, behind facilities, the, near the tennis courts. Turf one is the stadium? Turf one is the actual football stadium or stadium prop. Okay, because this, well then this has stadium turf and turf one on the white sheet. Yeah, I see that now. Yeah, and, and on the blue sheet. So the total on the blue sheet is four million and the total on the white sheet is 2.75 million. The old figures are correct. The 150,000 and the 550,000 are correct. The blue figures are accurate um, and not uh, what's written in white. I think the only correction needed is the 1 million is 1.75 million and the 1.75 million is 2.25 million. I'm not exactly sure why I okay. that way. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Are we making that change to the motion? Yes, thank you. Is there any objection to making that part of the main motion? <coughs> Make sure we have it right. Uh, 1.75. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1.75 should be the 2.25. 2. 2. 2. Thank you. Uh, and it should be turf 2. 2.25. Uh, 2. Is everyone clear on that? Clear as mine. Okay. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you. Harry Simmons, Precinct 4. Uh, under the general fund and under the uh, enterprise water and sewer, there's an item called uh, infrastructure assessment for 100 grand. Mm -hmm. Someone explain to me what that is. Mr. Lasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, sure, Harry. That's the one I mentioned. That the general fund is 100,000, and likewise, each three enterprise fund is 100,000. That's in order to assess the condition of what's underground for the three enterprise funds. We have a lot of 
growth going on in the downtown Haven Street area. Um, I believe we're obliged to study whether the water, the sewer, and the stormwater systems are adequate for this growth before it happens and not have a problem afterwards. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Stanley Moran, Precinct 7. Uh, I have a question about the reduction by 35,000 of police video vehicle integration. Uh, is that like dashboard cameras or is it for checking license plates? What is that? Mr. Lelash. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I don't know because that was a prior chief and the current chief said he had no interest in doing anything right away. So honestly, I don't really know what Jim Cormier had in mind. I believe it was dash cams. That's my best recollection. Does the chief have a different recollection? Yeah, he thinks that's what it was also. Are so that's we, not a high priority, in other words. Are we looking at dashboard cameras for the distant future, or? Um, well, if, if you will, it's moved out to FY22. I don't know how distant that is. Further discussion? Yes. Dimitri Tsakras, uh, Oak Street. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'm following up on Mr. Simmons' question because I'm confused. So there's a $100,000 study for water, another $100,000 for sewer, and another $100,000 for stormwater? And $100,000 for the general fund. It'll all be one study, but it'll cover those four components. Those are estimates, I have no idea what a study would cost, in other words, proportionally. Um, once we put out an RFP, we can perhaps come back if we need to and adjust those figures. Just a wild guess on my part, there's four different components, 100,000 each seemed like a, a good place to start. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? And appearing, are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Business under Article 4, Mr. Galaska. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, for new town meeting members, this is where we actually uh, ask you to spend money. I will note um, three corrections from what was in your original warrant report that are also part of tonight's handout. They all revolve around the $85,000 school technology. So first of all, that is added, as you can see in line C99. In order to pay for that, we have to find 85,000. The first change is a, res is a reduction of debt service by 35,000. And the other piece to that at the very bottom is an increase in excise taxes of 50,000. So by reducing an expense and increasing revenue, that's how it's paid for. Um, let me step through it a little bit more carefully. Capital, I think we've just discussed pretty well for 550,000. Um, if I were to describe the full description of the TLT debt service, I tried that with one FinCom member earlier and she screamed. So I think I'll reserve a full explanation other than it involved the DOR and it involved the IRS and it involved the town accountant and the town manager. And it, it involved a philosophical choice where we could have, um, if you will, stuck the taxpayer with a cost of a million and a half dollars outside the tax levy and no one would have known for the high school project. We had anticipated a last MSBA reimbursement of about a million and a half would reduce that debt to the taxpayer. Um, the IRS has declined to allow that. So the one and a half million will come back inside the tax levy. Um, in order to, if you will, reimburse the taxpayer, we are reducing by $75,000 a year for the remainder of the high school debt, the taxes assessed. Um, and then the last piece, um, you know, we'll come back from the MSBA. So we, we ended up borrowing four and a half million dollars for TLT instead of six million as we had expected. It's an extremely complicated and technical issue. I guess for the December budget meetings, I'm gonna have to describe it, but for now, I think the important piece is um, we just borrowed less for TLT than we thought, so we have room in the debt service budget. We're also requesting um, three small changes in the operations of two town departments. One is an increase from 20 to 24 hours a week for the Human Elder Services Director. 
Um, the actual request was quite a bit higher. I, I didn't think it was reasonable and it was sustainable for next year. The other request is to increase uh, our inspection hours. Uh, as of last January, we offered uh, Friday inspection hours. As, as you can see around town, it's uh, quite busy. Um, again, the 88 to 96 hours was not adequate for what was requested, but again, it's, I think, the only sustainable number we can afford uh, going forward at this point. Lastly, the third item in the library um, expense, and I, I do want to point out in the original warrant report that was incorrectly labeled. The, the line is correct, L92, but that's library expenses. This will be a, an annual maintenance contract for the automated book sorter. And uh, after describing that to FinCom, I think the most important piece of this is not just the fact that it sorts books, but it's an inventory control piece of equipment. So it keeps track of all the uh, books coming back, um, much as any business would keep track of its inventory. The uh, total picture here is a request to increase spending by 422,000. There are some, even, um, some items below in revenue that we must by law recognize in order to set a tax rate. That includes new growth and state aid. New growth and state aid alone more than pay for that request and then there's some other uh, small adjustments made. We have FinCom report. No? Oh. Mr. Leiter. Um, at the Finance Committee meeting on October 11th, we voted 700 to uh, recommend this article to town meeting. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Does the increasing the elder service from 20 to 24 hours now uh, get her benefits? No, she was benefited already. Okay. Further discussion? Not appearing? Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Grant, uh, Precinct 4. Uh, Mr. Lasher, just in the context of the current budget environment that's very tight, we're talking about Positions being cut or not filled. It's just a, I'd maybe like just a little more understanding why we need um, this increase in public services wages. You talked about it a little bit, but just maybe a little bit more given you know, where we are currently, where we might be in the future. Thank you. Mr. Lalash. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the um, FY19 budget is not fully balanced by myself yet, but I will say these two changes will move forward in the proposed FY19 balance budget, even though it's a difficult budget. Um, for any of you that have gone to the different economic development and planning meetings, um, our above 55 population, which I'm a proud member of, um, is increasing faster than any other demographic in town. If the town wants to continue to provide the level of human elder services that it currently does, it's going to have to increase staffing over the future. It's as simple as that. This four-hour change is sort of a very small step in that direction. Um, that, that I would view as a permanent change given the dem demographics. The second item, it's, it's difficult to know, but I, I guess I'll call that not a permanent change. Um, right now, the uh, amount of projects and the amount of construction activity commercially in town is phenomenal. That can't last forever, but for now, we just need more inspection hours. Um, I will propose that again in a balanced FY19 budget, but beyond there, I can't say whether that will continue, whereas I know the Human Elder Services one will. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 5. Do we have any uh, primary, primary bills? None. Then uh, Mr. Arena moves to be laid the substance of Article 5 on the table. Is there a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. Business under Article 6 is extra. Thank 
you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this article is to approve the disposition of surplus property. There are six assets in total, three of which are coming from our DPW department with estimated values between $300 and $2,000, two from fire that have estimated values of under $5,000 and one from facilities. Approval of this article will allow the town to sell, exchange, or dispose of these items. Think on report. At our meeting on October 11th, the Finance Committee voted 7-0-0 to recommend this article. Thank you. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Mr. Brown. No problem, appreciate it. I think uh, the first item of facilities it should be GMC and not T. Just a typo. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, we will accept that as part of the motion. Is there objection? Okay, further discussion? 500 bucks. And appearing, are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Business under Article 7, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The purpose of this um, article is a housekeeping item, sort of. Um, basically what's happened is we had a debt authorization for a water improvements project and also a sewer station project. When we issued that debt, we received a premium. Instead of borrowing the whole amount of the debt authorization, we borrowed net the premium. So for the water improvements project, it was 353,500 that we received in premium, and so we reduced our borrowing in kind. The sewer station was a $2.4 million project. We borrowed just under 2.2 because we received 216,500 in premium. So in total, we had about 570,000 in net premiums that we reduced our borrowing by. So essentially what we're asking you to do here is to apply the premiums to the projects to make them whole, and then to reduce the debt authorization by those same amounts. Big call report, Mr. Leiter. The Finance Committee meeting on October 11th, we voted 7-0 with no abstentions to recommend this article. Well, maybe not. Further discussion? And appearing. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, that re requires a two-thirds vote. Were there any objections? Any uh, no's? Okay. We record it as a unanimous vote. Okay, business under Article 8, Police Chief, Mr. Sagala. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This change is just a uh, change that because the state law last year changed the, the fine for uh, the consumption of public consumption of marijuana can now only be $100, it cannot be $300 anymore like our bylaw states. This, this actually just brings us in the compliance with state law. Income report, Mr. Sylvester. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Sylvester, uh, bylaw committee chairman at our meeting of October 25th. Bylaw voted 400 to uh, recommend this article to town meeting. Is there further discussion? Not appearing. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Now, before we get into Article 9, let me just quickly explain how we plan on doing this. Um, we plan to treat this the same way that we handled the budget in April. The main motion is made calling for all listed changes. We will then begin discussion on each individual letter in the section. Unless there is an obvious connection to another section, we will restrict debate to the merits of that section. section. If you wish to offer an amendment, that is the time to do it. Before moving on, we will vote on the proposed amendment, but we will not vote on the section. When we've completed discussion on all sections, we will then vote on the whole motion as written or amended. Uh, Mr. Lalasher, are you speaking, or is it Mr. Sylvester? I think Paul. I think Paul Mr. Sylvester, I'm sorry. <coughs>
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, over the past year, the bylaw committee, which consists, as, consists of Stephen Crook um, and uh, Chris O'Donohue and Jeff Struble and myself have been going through the bylaw and working to try and harmonize it with the changes that we have made in the town charter. This is one of the results of that work. Um, in just about each case on here, the changes represent taking direct information from the charter and replacing it um, in the bylaw. So in each case, you'll uh, often see uh, we've got rid of a section and we've replaced it with in its entirety with the same wording that we have put in the charter. There are a couple of uh, amendments on here that are built in. Uh, they represented some changes that we found from the original uh, draft of the um, draft of the amendments, and uh, those corrections are, are now in your handout, so you will see them. Um, on our meeting of October 25th, the bylaw committee went through all of these one more time, and uh, we recommend them to you with a, a, a vote of 400. We have further work to do on this. Uh, we are meeting again next month to uh, start going through some of the other sections, and uh, we uh, look forward to uh, being able to go through the entire bylaw, <coughs> completing it for your approval. Okay, you all set? We will begin uh, discussion on section A. Is there any discussion? Not appearing, we'll move to section B. Section B. Then appearing, we'll move to section. Oh, is there somebody? I'm sorry. Yes. Ms. Schneider. Gina Schneider, Precinct 5. I move to edit part B to read delete section 1.10.3 in its entirety and replace each instance of gender reference in Reading's general bylaws with the appropriate. Inclusive terms is already seen, for example, in sections 5.4.1.4, 7.3.4.3, 8.8.2.1.4. For example, he with he or she, his with his or her, himself with himself or herself, as appropriate. And renumber section 1.10.4 as 1.10.3, and edit part E to remove the words and gender and also remove and words that import the masculine gender shall include the feminine gender. Do you have a uh, printed copy of that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ms. Snyder, more, more discussion? Yeah. Um, the bylaws currently have several sections that have clearer and more appropriate language. Um, so it's unnecessary to write a new paragraph that leaves this old gender language in the few sections where it has to date not been corrected. So you have all this stuff in there about gender in two different sections of what you're trying to do, but there already are several sections in the existing bylaws that have already corrected it. So it seemed like a very appropriate thing when you're doing this with the gender language to just fix it. So that's what this motion recommends. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, further discussion on the proposed amendment? I, um, Ms. Snyder? I have it on a stick if you wanna put it up. That would be great. Yeah.
Oh, somebody cut it. We all set with that? Okay. Is there further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes, right down here. Ann Landry, Precinct 5. I support the, the direction of this amendment. Uh, I do wonder if there is a way to make the language, in fact, more inclusive and, um, and to consider um, perhaps amending the language of the bylaws to make it gender neutral rather than uh, he or she, but you could make it more um, along the lines of um, making things plural and using they. Um, so that way we're not genderizing the language at all and it will account for people who might identify as not identifying with the the feminine or masculine gender as described um, in part E, words that import the masculine gender shall include the feminine gender. Some people don't identify as either. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Mutter, Jeff Struble, Precinct 7, and a member of the bylaw committee, and former member of the Charter Review Committee. Um, this language that you see here in this, in this particular uh, presentation is, is, is an attempt to bring it into uh, essentially direct compliance with what we did with the charter. Uh, I don't have any objection to the amendment. I just, as a member of the bylaw committee, I think it doesn't, it, it scares me a bit because uh, if the intent is to go and essentially make it consistent throughout the entire bylaw. Uh, I just have a feeling doing what is being proposed here may not be enough. Uh, as a member of the bylaw committee, I'd like to dig into this, frankly, and, and go through the whole thing and see if uh, we can achieve what is, is being attempted here. Plus, I think I thought I heard some uh, mention of a instructional motion really doing just, this, just that, going through and making this somewhat gender neutral. So I think this is a bit premature, and I think uh, if we just leave it as it was, it'll be in conformance with what we did with the charter, and we can go forward from there. But I have a feeling this is kind of stumbling along in, in, in fits and starts and not as, not as comprehensive as I think we'd like it to be. So I recommend um, uh, respectfully uh, voting down this one. Further discussion? Yes, uh, just one final comment here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sylvester. One comment that I would <coughs> make about this amendment as, as listed over here, it does not um, really pertain to item B at all. Yeah. Uh, item B is removing a section. Yes, it is on a similar subject, but the, uh, in essence, it's really a separate item altogether for us to go through the entire bylaw and, uh, and look at those references in general and uh, make changes. So I don't see that it should be um, attached to uh, item B, but I don't have an objection to it being uh, attached in general to the effort or uh, certainly merged in with, uh, with the uh, supposed future uh, instructional motion to uh, change some things. But uh, for right here, I don't see this belonging with um, B as it's listed. I will make a comment. While you were while we were speaking, I was trying to discern that same thing. Uh, I I agree with your comments. It does not really fit within the bounds of this article. It, it was hard to see at first, but it, it's too wide-reaching 
So I will have to rule that proposed amendment out of order. At this point, we will go back into um, any other discussion on Section B. Not appearing, we will move on to Section C. Any, any, there's been a, Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I understand the idea of local news medium replacing a newspaper. It makes sense in our, in the current, current world, but I'm just wondering if um, it's too broad. I think if somebody said, name the local newspapers, we could all name the local newspaper. So we would know what to look for, even online newspapers. But to just say, or other means or channel of information communication to which the general public has access. Without, that could be many, many different things to many people. And it could be a platform, a site that is here at one moment and not at another. And people might have different ideas of what is accessible. So. I, I think it's, I think the idea is good to move away from just a newspaper, but I'm just wondering if it's too broad because, you know, if you named what, what website, what platform, where would, I bet a lot of people in this room would have many different places. So how, how do you, how do you reconcile that? In, in, in our case here, we were really concentrating on again harmonizing with the uh, with the charter. So this language here is taken directly from Section 1.6 in the charter, which we recently uh, voted for and approved. Huh. <laughs> so it, it, we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. We took what was there. Got by me well, during the church with its discussion. Good points and, okay. it's, and perhaps it's bad points. So, wait, so, so I'm going to say that it's still a valid point. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what to say now because I think my point is still valid. I don't know if it if it's in the charter. Okay. Further discussion on section C. It's in time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dave Tuttle of Precinct 3. The wording is a little bit ambiguous or confusing to me because it says, has access within the town. Is it better to word that to say the general public within the town has access? Because the access uh, could be anywhere, anytime, but the uh, having access within the town is a little bit uh, confusing. Any comment on that? Why are you reading it? Is there further discussion? Yes, Mr. Long. Jamie Vaughn, Precinct 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just a question. I gather that there are some inconsistencies between the charter and the bylaws, hence this effort. So if we do not change the bylaws to be consistent with the charter and the two remain in conflict, or at least inconsistency, which takes precedent, the charter and the bylaws? I think it depends on exactly what the what the issue is, and then whether or not there is uh, um, any state for us to uh, to support that. Who makes that determination? <laughs> well, I have no idea. <laughs> well, well, it seems to me that. Uh, Perhaps that question should be addressed because, as you pointed out, you've just been through certain sections, 
So even if we pass all these, they will remain a number of potential inconsistencies. Mr. Mayors. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ramey Yars, your town council. Um, so, by law, if there is a conflict, an actual conflict, between the by, a bylaw and the charter, the charter takes precedent. So, bylaw needs to be, in all instances, interpreted in a way to be consistent with the charter. Best way for that to happen is if the language is identical. Then there can't be any confusion about whether they the same or a different meaning. Uh, so even something as as, uh, as inconsequential as as swapping the the uh, in the town uh, language, uh, I, I agree. It probably would be uh, uh, grammatically better to. Have to do the swapping, but uh, there's a rule of statutory construction that applies to bylaws and charters that says that if you write something different, you must have a different meaning. And um, that is a, uh, uh, an invitation for lawyers to spend a lot of time arguing over it and, and, and potentially uh, uh, getting into uh, mischief. So um, the best way to make sure that the bylaw is interpreted the same way as the charter is to use the same language. And if I remember correctly, the, the general court or the state legislature approved the charter, but they don't approve every bylaw, correct? Uh, well, that's not actually correct, no. Um, the, uh, we amended the charter in two different ways. Um, some of the portions of the charter we amended by a special act of the legislature, and so the legislature approved that. Um, but main body of the charter we amended by uh, a ballot question, voters did that. It was approved, the language of the charter was approved by the Attorney General, so it was allowed to go forward, um, just as our bylaws are approved by the Attorney General before they're allowed to go forward. So that process is, is similar, but the state didn't, um, didn't necessarily approve um, every bit of our charter. Further questions? I, I think I have a question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I have an answer. <laughs> Why don't you give me your answer? <laughs> <laughs> Further discussion in this section. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'm Bill Brown, Precinct 8, member of the two former Child Review Commissions. And we went round and round and round about this for quite a while. We didn't, weren't secure, you know, with which local newspaper, the Advocate, the Chronicle, or what. And uh, I think this is a good change. And just incidentally, uh, as I understand, there's no punishment for violating the uh, charter anyways. <laughs> Further discussion? Yes. Good evening, Megan Young, Precinct 4. So I just have a question. So is everything we're looking at actually just duplicating what has already been approved by us in the charter? Is that what I'm now hearing? There's no difference. If, if, are we looking at something that we've already said yes to in the charter, and you haven't made any changes that we're looking at that are any different than our, that are currently in our charter? Is that correct? There aren't any changes per se that aren't in the charter, but there are a few things. There's, there's one or two in here that uh, may be just a little bit different than the charter, and, and, and not to not to give away secrets or hold anything back or whatever. Um, you'll see a, a change on here which relates to. Uh, town meeting and reports from FinCom. And uh, we have uh, suggested a change here, which basically gives subsequent town meeting equal footing with um, annual town meeting, and removes a specific reference to 
a date um, like the second Monday in November or whatever that uh, we have made it back to exactly the same, um, I think it's 14 days before um, annual meeting applies to subsequent town meeting. That is not something that's in the charter at all. Okay, because the reason I ask is I'm when P comes up, I had something, but if it's already, like if I knew the difference between, okay, all of these, like these 15 are all from the charter and this, these two are ones we added, I think it might help the process. Just to thought. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Precinct 7. Um, so on this local news medium issue, um, right, this is a definition, uh, and it only gets used as this term then gets used within the general bylaw. So referring now to um, newspapers and um, in posting of notices. So, um, but, but due to public notice law, we have to put everything in newspapers at the present moment, correct? I, when we when we publicly post things, Mr. Um, and so and so, I'll, I'll finish, um, and so um, until my sense is that until the state grapples with how to provide public notice um, in some news media that's local that everyone has access to, this. It, I, I get it. It, it, it makes sense to provide it as um, to provide language if you don't need to change every time that the state changes something. But until they grapple with that, and we don't have to post notice in a local newspaper, this sort of seems like a moot point. Am I in my um, understanding this incorrectly, Mr. Mayor? I would never presume to say that you're, you're understanding something incorrectly, but here we go. There are a multitude of public notice requirements. Some derive from state law, and some derive from uh, town bylaws. Our bylaws require, um, in every instance, that notice be published in a um, local news medium, um, which is a definition broad enough to include a newspaper. If in those circumstances where state law requires that that publication be in the newspaper, uh, the, that state law will still require that and we will have to comply with it. Uh, so, uh, a so publication in the newspaper will always be good enough under our bylaw, but when it's not required to be in the newspaper, uh, some different medium would be permissible under our charter and bylaw. Thank you. Further discussion? <coughs> Mike Barry, Precinct 3. Um, so since what we're doing for a lot of these is just taking what's in the charter and moving it to the bylaw, and to your point, the charter will trump the bylaw. Is it, if, would you say the most effective way to make a change to any of these that is just duplicating that is to have a different discussion about the charter and then we come back and talk about the bylaw? Mr. Mayor, Well, if we didn't have to pay attention to how hard it is to amend the charter, <laughs> yes, that would be the most effective way of doing it. Further discussion? And a period. We move on to section D. Any discussion? Oh, just okay. just so you uh, know on section D, um, section D is again harmonizing with the uh, charter. Again, section 1.6 of the charter, which happens to be titled uh, definitions. So uh, that's why there's more than uh, one item coming from there. Ms. O'Neill? Ms. O'Neill? 
Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. So can we follow up on Megan's recommendation, which is really just, if you could just tell us going forward which one is just a replication of what's in the charter, so we don't, there's no point discussing it because we can't change it. So can we just avoid discuss, discussing those and only discuss the ones that are actual new additions or changes separate from the charter? Is that possible to do that so we can just move it along? Thank okay. you. So, um, section D there, precinct, is right from the charter. Uh, section E, number and gender, is also from the charter, section 86. Um, the, uh, we are inserting a new section, computation of time. That is also from the charter, from the charter section 8.5. Which letter are we on? That would be uh, F. Okay. Um, section G is related to just um, some minor fixes where we are getting rid of, we're removing uh, local newspaper and replacing that with that term, local news medium, which is uh, the, the new definition and, and term are. So is that copying the chatter? Is that correct, G? It, it's it's really just a clarification. So it's it's not really copying anything from the charter. We have removed local newspaper as a definition per se or a term, <coughs> and replaced it with local news medium. Maybe the quickest way is to go back the way we were doing it, and you can make it a quick comment in front of each one, and then that may solve some of the issues. So we'll go back to anything on section D. Oh, Mr. Sylvester, do you have any comments on that? So again, as a reminder, um, section D is precinct. It's coming directly from the uh, from uh, uh, harmonization with the uh, charter in section 1.6. Okay, any discussion on that? Okay, we'll move to section E, Mr. Sylvester. Section E, uh, number and gender, is uh, the same as uh, the charter section 8.6. Okay, any discussion on E? Not appearing, we'll move on to section F, Mr. Sylvester. Section F is uh, adding a, uh, a new section, and that new section comes directly from uh, section 8.5 of the charter. Okay, any discussion on that? Here, section G, Mr. Sylvester. All right, on section G, section G is so oh, much. Like, you got a question on F? Yes, I on E. On E, we put by that. Did you? I tried to. Okay, okay. Mr. Mr. Munn. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy Munn, Precinct 4. So, section E says that the masculine gender will remain and shall include the feminine gender. And as I understand it, that's directly from the charter. So if we try and change the bylaws to be what Ms. Snyder recommended, it would be in conflict with the charter. So if we want to make a new gender neutral change, we have to change the charter. Correct? Well, those of you who are, uh, had the pleasure of being here for the charter, I mean, remember that we had this exact discussion with respect to this corresponding provision right. in, with respect to the charter. Right now, the charter says, we, in interpreting the charter, that the, the words importing the masculine shall, shall mean to include the uh, feminine. And we're using that, this provision would use that same rule of interpretation um, with respect to the Bible. So we're using the same language, but, um, <coughs> but the provision in the charter <coughs> applies to how to interpret the charter. And this would say you're going to interpret the Bible in the same way. So, uh, 
I don't have a, 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 a big preference one way or the other, but it is possible to use a different rule of construction for the bylaw, uh, and maybe that won't cause too much mischief. Well, to cause a little bit of the mischief, um, Mr. Moderator, could we insert Ms. Snyder's amendment here, because this is directly related to gender reference throughout the bylaws. <laughs> Although the subject is similar, it would still be adding changes to several sections, so I would not allow that. Well, it's just to the definition. Right, but the, the proposed amendment changed several sections, not just this. Further discussion? Ms. Binder? but doesn't that say words contained in the bylaw so that that new section changes several sections? And that's the way the motion is written, correct? Right, so why wouldn't, um, why wouldn't Ms. Snyder fit in here? We are on E, right? We are on here. Okay, so but this is words contained in this bylaw. So this this amendment refers to the entire bylaw, and her amendment refers to the entire bylaw. So but this section this is this is what's the problem with doing this on the fly. It takes time to think about this. Um, this section is telling you what is implied, but the, um, the amendment, let me just read it again. So, hold on one second, let if, me. If just the yellow part is, I'm is. Talk to the town council. Okay, the, the motion on the section E is an interpretation of how something would be interpreted throughout the bylaw. 
proposed amendment was actually changing different sections. So that would be outside of the, the bounds. So the part number and gender, um, can I propose to strike the words and words that import the masculine gender shall include the feminine gender? Can we just strike that? You want to strike the word? Yes. It's, it's hard to know without what it actually says right now. But I guess the point is that you're changing it to, to say that it doesn't have to be gender neutral or the male pronoun counts for the female pronoun also. And I don't remember the discussion in the charter. I remember it was really big and it might have been late at night. <laughs> so what is your, what are you proposing now then? Well, I, I, I like the suggestion that, that Gina's uh, be put in here, but if that is not allowed, then I would say strike the part that says, and words that import the masculine gender shall include the feminine gender. So you want to strike that last from, from the semicolon on? If that is the allowable option that you were Does that do what you want to do? I, I, I'm, I would allow it, but I'm not sure it's doing what you are hoping to do. Someone else have an... Okay, okay before I accept that motion. Okay. Uh, did you have a comment? Yes, yes. Um, Linda Snow Doxer, Beaver Road. Um, I just like to suggest maybe the wording could be, um, and words that import the masculine or feminine gender shall be interpreted as gender neutral. That, that would be so. Did, um, is that is that okay with Ms. Binda? <laughs> would, you re would you repeat those words again? I'm sorry, I want to make sure we have it right. Um, and words that import the masculine or feminine gender shall be interpreted as gender neutral. Second, second. Further discussion on that proposed amendment. Ms. Kamani. Jamie Mullen, Precinct 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just a question. By interpreted, does that mean that we're going to change the words in the bylaws? Or just when you read he, you think he, she? <laughs> Mr. Barry, do you have a comment? For the moment, we're going to look at the word he and think he or she. Uh, the, prob what the, the problem is, is that there isn't currently, within the four corners of the uh, warrant, there isn't a provision to make all of the changes that I think everybody wants, that to change all references to, um, to the masculine, to include the feminine in some way. And um, <laughs> uh, so uh, we don't have that before town meeting. I suspect that we're going to get an instructional motion about that. And that means that at the next town meeting, we'll have a whole uh, proposal for dealing with all of the uh, um, gender specific terms that are contained in the bylaw. So for now, the best stopgap is something on the order of what you've got here. So I interpret that to mean if we change the word interpreted to change to general neutral, that would be unacceptable. That would, that would be outside the four corners. That's what the moderator is working for. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the answer. <coughs> Peter 
Crash uh, 3. Um, this is a perfect example of why you don't put 50-year-old men in charge of writing down feminine or whatever. Gentlemen, you need to get a rid of interpreting. You need to rewrite it neutral. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that you're capable of doing that. That's my opinion. Mr. B. Mr. B. Harris, uh, Mr. Pacino, did you have a hand up? I, for one, am perfectly capable of doing this. <laughs> okay? If someone has to ask us to do it, and it sounds like and before this town meeting is over, there will be such a request. It can be done. The, um, there are a lot more um, uh, masculine words in the, in the Bible than just he and him and him. So you're going to have to, uh, we we'll have to go through it carefully and make sure that we get them all. Mr. Pacino. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Meyer. Focusing on Precinct 5, uh, I've also led the last two codifications before this one, which uh, bring in the uh, ballots and the, the charter. I was also a member of the uh, last charter review commission, and I was also, I am a former chairman for life of the bylaw committee. <laughs> Mr. Sylvester has my position now. Maybe I'll make him come back. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of places here you don't know what other changes could be needed here. There are other places in the bylaws where this thing could affect things negatively. That's why, you know, we should not be changing things on town meeting floor. The late George Theophanis, God bless his soul, wherever he is, said, you know, you either vote up or down the bylaws. Don't try to amend it. If you have a problem, you send it back, which is what the instruction of motion is, to send it back with instructions as to what should be done. You know, I, you know, I, 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 don't want, I don't want to sound like I'm insensitive to masculine versus feminine, but you know, I'm afraid there may be other changes, other places we need to make that we don't know about that are out there that affect other sections. So I'm gonna vote against the amendment. If it, I don't know if it's even allowed from what I just heard here. And, you know, send an instructional motion back to the bylaw committee. Again, maybe they'll agree to come, make a comeback. And we can maybe get this straightened out, you know, as to what it is. Now, I can tell you on my 27 years on the, on the bylaw committee, this is a topic that came up over and over and over and over again. And Mr. Russell can attest to that too, who's sitting here also when he was a member of this committee. So, and even in the chat of review, we discussed this an awful lot. And so, you know, again, go with the instructional motion, send it back with instructions, and have the bylaw committee relook at it to solve it. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Mr. Herrick. Uh, Steve Herrick, Precinct 8. Uh, generally speaking, I think this, this looks fine, although I uh, agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Pacino that this is probably something that needs to go back to the bylaw committee. One thing I'd be concerned about is that <clears throat> without looking at the entire bylaw, which I don't know that closely, uh, if there was something in the bylaw that, that did specifically call out male or female, it, it intended to say men can't do this or women can't do that, and I don't know if it is or if that's even legal, this throws the whole thing into confusion. So by specifically saying it's one means the other, in all instances, you open up this weird thing. So I would agree with this, you know, this should probably be sent back to bylaw to come up to be reviewed in the context of the entire bylaws to make sure that it is uh, what we all intend. I think everybody intends the same thing. We all want this to be not masculine or feminine, uh, gender neutral, but without looking at the entire bylaw, Sort of a weird situation. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes, in the back room. Heather Clish, Deering Street. Um, I'm going to vote for this amendment, and I would vote for anything that would suggest we should go back and, 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 and update the whole bylaw. My reason is that, notwithstanding anything that we might not have read about in a bylaw, 
anything that would work to say that the masculine should be interpreted as feminine should also work to say it should be interpreted as gender neutral. If it works to be feminine, it should work for the other. I see no reason why it wouldn't. The violence committee would do that. It opens it up. It solves a little bit of a problem, perhaps temporarily, until we can uh, take, a, take a further review of the whole bylaw for this. For the discussion on the proposed amendment. Yes, Mr. Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for my answer for Precinct 4. You want to make a, an observation here. Um, one thing that we could do would re require a, another rewrite of the charter and a total rewrite of the uh, bylaws, and that is to use something like uh, the federal government uses, the FAA, for example, says no person shall operate an aircraft without so the person is gender neutral. Something like that could be done for every instance in the charter and the bylaw that references uh, a gender and it would solve the problem. There'd be no he or she, his, her, whatever in the charter or the bylaw, just person. But that's another big project. I think that the amendment should not pass because the charter is as was put up there. Keep it the same as the charter. And if we want to make some kind of a change like that, set up an instructional motion again, call another uh, charter review committee. We go through it, find out those wor words, and it requires restructuring uh, sentences and so on to make it uh, totally gender neutral person instead of he, she, or whatever. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Uh, Denise Seckers, Precinct 4. Um, I want to say thank you to the people on the bylaw committee. That has to be a very difficult job. And I don't think you were um, asked to fix all the gender issues in the bylaws. So you made a, I don't think so. So you made a stab at it and I appreciate it. I will vote for this because the woman who spoke before, I'm sorry, I don't, I didn't catch her name, makes a good point that, you know, if it says, okay, masculine can also read feminine, well then this seems to work fine. But um, is it possible to, Say, since there is an instructional motion coming that will cover a lot of what's been talked about, well, maybe it's time to move to F. I don't know. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Sylvester. I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that one of the goals of the um, bylaw committee early on here was to take care of those issues which were um, different between the bylaw and the charter. Um, I would want to assure all of our town meeting members that um, I think it's, it's safe to speak for the entire committee that we are indeed sensitive to the gender issue um, and from time to time are, have talked about it, um, but to enable us to make some uh, reasonable progress and get things through town meeting, our first stab was to look at harmonizing with the charter. So we have, in some sense, tried to, uh, in order to get through more sections in the, in the bylaw, um, maybe you could say we've taken the easy way out in a sense, but our goal was to harmonize with the charter first, understanding that there may be um, issues there, and that we are indeed uh, sensitive to those, uh, to those issues and, and do not have any uh, you know, reason to, uh, to not try and do that if uh, town meeting should instruct us. Further uh. discussion on the proposed amendment? Ms. Snyder.
Gina Snyder, Precinct 5. I think as town council pointed out, bylaws are not the charter. And so I think this is a good amendment to start the process of getting us where we need to go. Not say that for the entire town, we're defining masculine to mean the feminine gender as well. So I think this is a good amendment. We should get started on it, and I plan to vote for it. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? None appearing. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. We have already discussed F. Is there any further discussion on that? Okay, G, Mr. Sylvester? Uh, again, G is just uh, replacing local newspaper with uh, local news medium to go along with the, uh, with the definition. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll move to section H, Mr. Sylvester. If you look at uh, section H, section H is really just changing a, a few small things. Uh, words like um, money to funds, um, again, trying to harmonize with uh, some of the other definitions that exist in the, uh, in the charter. Um, we felt uh, number four on there is inserting uh, a, a comma that we thought uh, was necessary there. We hope the uh, grammatical folks in the audience will not shoot us for that. Um, And in uh, number one, you see that uh, uh, we have just changed it very slightly. Instead of uh, the bylaw, in essence, it is this bylaw, referring to uh, the document itself. And then uh, the charter, which of course is, is a separate document. Is there further discussion on this section? And up here, we move to section I, Mr. Sylvester. Section I, again, it's uh, um, you know, getting rid of some newspaper and replacing it with a local news medium. So again, it goes with the definition. It's slightly different to go with the, the wording or, or tense that's uh, um, currently in the bylaw. Is there further discussion? Here, we'll move to section J, Mr. Sylvester. Ah, uh, if you look at, at uh, that particular section, this is a very easy one. The, uh, the charter is not labeled with dashes, it's labeled with dots. Further discussion on that? Uh, and that's not the only one that's like that, by the way. Any further discussion on that? And up here, we move on to section K. Mr. Sylvester. K is really, is just a, a clarification of the uh, precinct meeting. We have replaced it to uh, absolutely um, uh, spell it out. So it is a little bit different than um, than what was there before. The charter does not talk about uh, precinct meetings, I believe. So we were just trying to make the wording a little more clear. Okay, further discussion on section K. And then appearing section L, Mr. Sylvester. Section L is one where we have put in a recommendation. Section L is, is a new change. If you look in currently on the Rules Committee, there is really no requirement for the Rules Committee to ever meet and go over anything. Um, I, don't think there has, I don't believe there has been a, a, a meeting in a while. Not that we have needed one. Um, it was, my law committee 
felt that uh, uh, there should be something in there. And right. so uh, you have that requirement there of once every two years. Any further discussion on that section? Yes, Mr. Pitt. Rushmore. Is it possible to move to the next section that you guys have added new material to instead of just referring to the charter changes? Well, they have any questions on some of the things, so I, I'd like to just go through the letters as we have gone through. Any, anything else in section L? No. Okay, section M, Mr. Sylvester. If you look at section M, um, it's written for uh, a single position of a town treasurer or collector and I believe that is not what we are doing currently. And uh, so that section is now referring to just the town collector. And if you look, it's just the title that's changing, not the wording of the section. Is there further discussion on that? Another parry, we'll move on to section 10, Mr. Sylvester. Similarly with, similarly with Section N, it's, uh, uh, the title has just been changed to Duties, and it's referring to Town Collector. It follows in that, uh, in that same line. Discussion? Section O, Mr. Sylvester. Section O, um, dealing with receipts, that is deleted from um, that section of is there any discussion? Oh, yes. Okay. The, the section on receipts really um, deals more with uh, things that the uh, collector does, I believe. And uh, so we have actually um, covered that in, uh, in letter P. So that section goes away from there and it comes back um, in a later section. Yeah. Is there any discussion? So, O deletes receipts. P creates the new section for town treasurer, which is the two positions that we have. And uh, underneath the uh, treasurer come back the uh, the duties and the um, and the handling of receipts, which previously, in essence, got deleted. Okay. Further discussion on that? Yes. Jamie Moore, Precinct Four. Did we just say it was the tab collector, not the treasurer, that collected the money? And now we're saying the tre the treasurer receives. Uh, no. Final. No, the collector receives. Well, it says the town treasurer. Pay over the town treasurer's cash all money received by. I'm, I'm I sorry. interpret that it's her during the preceding week or lesser period. No, I, I, I am in error. I misspoke. Yes, it is the town treasurer who, who gets the receipts. Is that it? Friendly amendment then to change that? No, this is this is correct. What I first said was so the treasurer gets the receipts. Treasurer gets the receipts, not the And so up above, the collector does not get the receipts. That's correct. Which is why um, we delete, deleted receipts in O. That was under the collector. Point of order, Mr. Crook. Point of order. Stephen Crook, Precinct 2, and a member of the Bylaw Committee. 
what is worthy to note here is that the former collector slash treasurer handled the receipts. So what we are doing is we're eliminating receipts in reference to only the collector, and it appears now under only the treasurer. So it, it's, it's the collector treasurer that was handling receipts. Now it will be just the treasurer handling receipts. Mr. Lashen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Part of the discussion of the charter um, was that the position was last, was combined, treasurer-collector, I think it was called. And there are a number of duties and other responsibilities listed under that. Um, without knowing we would have a, a resignation, I thought it was better to split the position in the charter and in the bylaws and have it make sure each position had its duties and its responsibilities and then the charter says um, the selectman may combine those two if the town manager um, requests it. As it turns out, when we first did that, I did request that because we that's what we had. Um, the treasurer collector since left, and the position has now been split. But the bylaw is simply attempting to do what the charter did, which was take a combined position and split out the different duties and responsibilities to the two parts. But, but it's the collector that collects the receipts. Uh, and then turns them over to the treasurer. So the treasurer also collects them from the collector. It's fascinating to watch. <laughs> Mr. Garrison? Yes, Mr. Garrison. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Bo Garrison, Precinct 5. And um, this is an opportunity to write the language. Yeah, there you go. Sorry. Um, this is an opportunity to write the language gender neutral from the start. So on uh, this, these paragraphs here, the, the, the bottom of paragraph 3.2.4.1 has a reference to he, and they can just say the, the treasurer. And then in 3.2.4.2, there's many references to he and him. And those can all be changed to say the town treasurer, leaving all uh, uh, gender reference uh, out of the paragraph entirely. Okay, we're still on section O, but that's, uh, I, will, I will recognize you when we get there. Is there any more discussion on section O? We did? Oh, excuse me, I guess we did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Garrison, I'm sorry, I guess we did. That was. <coughs> So are you, are you offering an amendment? Uh, yes, to change all those references to the town treasurer. seems like an opportunity when we're creating language to get it right. Is this what you intend? Yes. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Mr. Barrys, did you? Oh, you're good, okay. I think it's a hand behind the, uh, Mr. Brown? Yes. Uh, while we're at it, uh, 
select men should be select persons. <laughs> already here. I don't know. That would be outside of the bounds because selectman is already uh, defined somewhere else. That would be something we'd have to be looked at at another time. Okay, is for discussion on those that proposed amendment. Yes, Mr. Crook. Stephen Crook, Precinct 2, and member of the Bylaw Committee. I would support this amendment. This is, this is reasonable. You eliminate the uh, male uh, pronoun. Makes, makes the paragraph a little longer, but it accomplishes gender neutrality. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? That appearing. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. We have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. This is, this is non-debatable. All those in favor of adjourning until Thursday evening, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. This time we stand adjourned until Thursday evening. Well, yeah. They don't, they don't like it.